All right, come on. Good morning, Go Church family. How many of you are glad to be here today? Let's go. Up this side over here. Everybody's good over here on this side. You're doing good today? Everybody in the middle, you feel good? This is the good looking group right here. I see that. What about all of you over here? You feel good today? Come on. You look good, by the way. Everybody online, it's a joint and honor to live stream our gatherings today. So whoever you are, wherever you're watching from online, we greet you. Most of you know this, we're one church. We've got multiple locations. So we've got a rowdy bunch of people here on the south side of Atlanta. And then we live stream to our west side Atlantic campus there on the beautiful property of the city of Refuge in the 30314 zip code. So we greet all of you. And then 700 miles from here, we got our Germantown, Maryland campus. They're in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So whatever campus you're a part of today, whether you're in this room or another room or maybe in your living room, we greet you. We say we love you and God bless you. So come on, church family, every location, put your hands together. Welcome one another. Let's go. I love that. And then you know this, uh, if you've been a part of Go Church for any period of time, we've got a tradition here before we get into the message where we pause to give honor to the brave men and women that serve as, as uh, first responders and also those that have been in the military and those who are currently serving in the military. So this is just a quick moment of appreciation to say thank you for your service and your sacrifice. As a matter of fact, we've got two weekends back to back that honor our military men and women. This weekend happens to be Armed Forces Weekend or Armed Forces Day. And so if you have served in the military or if you are serving in the military at any campus, uh, would you raise your hand and let us know that's you? Come on, we just wanna say thank you. Come on, real quick, can you say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, God bless you. And then first responders as well, we say a wholehearted God bless you. We thank God for you and we're, we're better because of you. And then you saw this a moment ago in the announcement. I got one announcement. It's a recap of what you heard, but I just want to share my heart and then I'll pray for you. We'll get into the message. But this is for the guys, specifically for the guys. We got our Man Up Conference coming in just a few weeks. Space is limited. I know you hear that a lot and it's like, I don't believe it, but you got to believe it, okay? We got 200 spots available and they're going to go fast. We might be 50% of the way to capacity already. So I'm encouraging you fellas. And I know, I know it's a little harder for guys to kind of get out of their comfort zone, go to a, a men's conference and all of that. You will not be disappointed, all right? You're not going to be disappointed. We got a great weekend planned. It's a Friday night, a half day Saturday, and we're going to feed you. Come on, so how's that, all right? So we want to invite you to come. Friday night, we've got a Leon Scrump, former NFL football player, pastor of church, author, speaker, really just a fantastic man. Saturday morning, we've got head coach Kenny Dallas from Trinity Christian School. He coaches uh, the school here on the south side of Atlanta. Should I say state champion coach Kenny Dallas, author of M46 Dads, tremendous speaker, tremendous speaker. And then I'm going to close the event out. So guys, if you've not signed up, I encourage you to do that. And then ladies, as a part of your Father's Day gifts, because you're going to give plural gifts to the men of your life, like all the dead, multiple things. Let a registration a man of conference be one of those things. They won't be disappointed. And I can't wait to see all the guys. How many of you believe that God is moving in the men of Go Church? I believe that with my whole heart. And so I want you to come and be a part of that, okay? And then today, let me pray for you, but let me catch you up to today is week number two of our annual series that we do here at Go Church called Ask Away. I love this series because you drive the conversation. And here's what I mean. On Easter Sunday, you filled out a survey and one of those questions was, tell us a topic that you'd like to hear a message preached on here at Go Church. We calculated all of those surveys and in five Sundays during Ask Away, we're gonna take the five most selected topics of discussion, all right? So last Sunday, we talked about how do we forgive people? How do we deal with difficult people? If you were here last Sunday, or maybe you missed last Sunday, you should go back and listen. If you were here last Sunday and you still haven't forgiven that person, go back and listen again. Somebody say amen to that, all right? How do we forgive people? How do we deal with difficult people? That was one of the most selected topics of discussion. A right, right connected to that in terms of the amount of surveys turned in was, how do I know God's will for my life? How can I discover God's will for my life, God's plan for my life? And I wanna to talk to you about that today. I believe, and I don't say this lightly, I genuinely believe that God has given me a, a little bit of revelation in this message today. Uh, even late last night, God was showing me some things. I hope to be able to present that in a clear way. So in order to do that, I need prayer. I know you need prayer. You had a busy week. You got a busy week coming up. So let's allow God to speak to us in the next 90 minutes during this long sermon. Can I get an amen from somebody? Come on. The more amens you say, the faster I preach. There we go. We're going to be here till tomorrow. Come on now. 
Let me pray for you. You pray for me. Let's take 10 seconds, invite the Holy Spirit in, remove distraction. Let the Holy Spirit speak to our heart, all right? Come on, just a moment of meditation here. Thank you, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Listen here, church. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Anoint me, Jesus, in this moment. Anoint those that are listening. Open their spiritual eyes and ears and heart. I know you got a word for us today as we discover God's will for our lives. So we're giving you these next few moments and we're asking you to speak to us and I'm asking you to speak through me in the most precious name we pray. That is the name of Jesus because Jesus has all authority and together everybody said amen and amen. We've clapped a lot for a lot of people. Can we take five seconds, give Jesus the best praise we've got? Come on, let's go. Come on, if you love him, come on, can you just applaud Jesus? Come on. It's good. Uh, typically, whenever I give you a message, I always unpack each particular thought as we, as we walk through the message. Today, I'm going to kind of flip the script a little bit. I'm going to give you all three components of God's will up front. So I'm not going to make you wait with great anticipation. I'm going to give them all to you up front, and then we'll unpack them together. I do want to encourage you, and I know some of you, we've got a really great culture of note-taking here at Go Church at all of our campuses. I want to encourage you to do that today. This is a good thing, what I'm about to say, by the way, but I've got over two dozen scripture references for you to chew on today. Are you good that a preacher uses the Bible when he preaches? I'm making sure, all right? So I want you to make sure you write those down. I, I believe that all of us have a desire to be in God's perfect will. If that's you, can I see your hand? Come on, I want to be in God's will. All of us are faced with daily decisions, right? We all got choices that we're trying to make. We, want to make the, we don't just want to make the right choice. We want to make the wise choice. We don't just want to make good decisions. I want to make God decisions. So I want you to write down some thoughts here. I'll give you three components of God's will. Truth be told, I've, I've taught a lot about the will of God. I have never taught it this way. And I'm really, really humbled that the Holy Spirit revealed his word to me in the way that I want to teach it to you this morning. Uh, this isn't necessarily uh, a message that other pastors haven't preached on. I'm sure that they have. But this sermon didn't come from Google. Come on now. This was downloaded by the Holy Spirit in my heart, and I want to give it to you this way. So three components of God's will, and I'll show you all three, and then I'll unpack all three of them. There is God's secret will, his secret will. Then there is God's revealed will, and then God gives us free will. So you have the secret will of God, you have the revealed will of God, and then God gives all of us, every single day, the ability to make choices and to choose. It's God's free will that, that he gives to, to humanity. I've shared this a hundred times in 20 plus years of full-time ministry. The story of when I was 13 and my father passed away. What I want to share out of that whole experience in this conversation is the verse of scripture that my mom gave to me on the morning of the phone call that we received uh, that my father had a massive heart attack and died. So in the middle of my mom's grieving, in the middle of her pain, in the middle of her sorrow, I mean, it was just, and for those of you that have lost somebody that you loved, especially unexpectedly, you know the, the horror of that moment, the, the tragedy of that moment. But my mom ministered to me at 13 years old, and, and now here I am, I'm, I'm 41 years old. I know I look 25 to you. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Throw your pastor a bone. Thank you. Much love to you. God bless you. And... Uh, but here I am, 41 years old, and all these years later, I still hold firm to God's word uh, that she shared with me on that day. And I, I believe for the rest of my life, I'm going to hold on to Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. And in this one verse, we see that God has a secret will and that God has a revealed will. So if you have your Bible, I want you to flip there. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make the scripture available here on the screen in a moment. But I want you to go there. It's the, the fifth book of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses is talking to the children of Israel, although incredibly applicable 
and uh, needed for our life today. He's reminding them about their renewal to the covenant. And in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, and here's what I'll do. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to invite all of you at whatever campus you're part of today to read it with me. I'll read it first, and then I'll instruct you on how and when to read it together, okay? Here's Here's what God's word says. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. And then this is an important piece of this whole teaching that we may follow all of the words of this law. All right, let's read this on the count of three. Everybody try to stay in in cadence with each other. Ready? One, two, three. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all of the words of this law. And here it is. God has a secret will, and God has a revealed will. Let's talk about the secret will of God for a moment. The secret will of God. This will make a lot more sense to you the the longer I unpack it for you, all right? So the secret will of God is God's mysterious will. The secret will of God is is God's hidden will. This isn't on the TV, but, but I do feel like it's important to say this to you, is that God's secret will is God's sovereign will. Meaning God is sovereign. God is in complete control. God has all authority and God has all power. And while you and I want to see the big picture, we want God to let us in on every single detail of what he's doing because you and I like control. Isn't that true? God is sovereign and he says, there are some parts of your journey and your story and your life and my plan that you don't get control of. I'm not going to give you the full picture. You don't get to see all of the missing pieces of the puzzle. You're just going to have to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. Can you help me preach already? I feel like preaching a little bit. This is the secret will of God. And although it's secret, meaning we don't know everything that's about to happen. And sometimes in real time, we don't even understand what God is doing. You ever had that moment? God, like, what? What are you doing up there? And even though it's a secret plan, a secret will, God is still sovereign. And God is still faithful. And God is still good. And what we want is we want full control. We want to see all and we want to know all. And if we saw all and knew all, we would be like God. But we ain't God. So we have to walk by faith. We can't just walk by by what we see, the things that we we can see. Uh, A a perfect example of, of scripture here is Isaiah chapter number 55. I love this verse because it reminds me of the transcendence of God. Just how big God is. And, and here's a word that we overuse, you know, in our, our, our daily vocabulary, I guess. But we talk about how things are awesome. The only thing that's really awesome is the awesomeness of God. And this verse just reminds me about how big God is, how powerful God is, how awesome God is. And he says, for, for my thoughts, they're not like your thoughts. Anybody thankful for that? Good Lord. And he says, and my ways... They're not like your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, come on somebody, so are my ways higher than your ways and so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I know that you think that, and because I do this, that if I knew all the missing pieces to my life story and if I could see into the future, that everything would work out according to like my plan and my agenda. But listen to me, God God is a big God. And let me tell you, God knows what he's doing. And the older I get, and I'm getting some age on me now, come on now, but the older I get, the easier it is to look back over the rear view mirror of my life and see how the secret will of God was far better than what I thought I needed in my own life. When I look back over my lifetime and I I see how I was frustrated in the moment, how I was growing weary in the moment, how I was overwhelmed with anxiety in the moment, but now when I look back, I can see, thanks be to God that his plan wasn't my plan, that his plan was far better than my plan. Let, op- let me give you a little example here, an opportunity to respond. Some of y'all almost dated that crazy girl. You almost married that crazy girl. Some of y'all almost married that crazy guy you dated, and you thought when y'all broke up, oh, Lord. And now look at him on Facebook. 
they're not just crazy, they are cray-cray. Come on, somebody. God done saved you. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house? You would, and, and you see her family? Crazy. But God protected you. Some of you got so frustrated that you didn't get that job all those years ago or God closed that door of opportunity and you were frustrated because you thought that you knew better than God. But look where you are now. Can I get 100 people to testify to that? And when I look back over my life and when you look back over your life at the secret will of God, the secret plan of God, now when we look in the rear view mirror, here's what we know, that God works things for the good. All things God is working them together for good. God's not out to get you. God's not out to harm you. God's not out to punish you. God's got a good plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, without taking it out of context, the Lord says, for I know the plans I have for you. You don't know the plans I have for you, but I know the plans I have for you, and they are plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you hope and to give you future. And if you'll just walk by faith and trust the secret, sovereign plan of an awesome God, God God will do extraordinary things. God will blow your mind. Our minds are so finite, yet we worship an infinite God. And God is up to good on your behalf. So this is just a message I needed to hear from me. Stop complaining and just trust and obey. Write this thought down. Most of the time, we can only understand the secret will of God when we look back in the rearview mirror of our life. When I look back, I can see, man, God, God didn't miss a detail. He was there through all of it. And while it didn't make sense to me in real time, it never caught God by surprise. And let me tell you this too. You don't have enough power and you don't have enough control to derail the sovereignty of God's will or plan. No, 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 no. Let's not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. No matter the decisions you make or don't make, no matter the choices you make or don't make, God's sovereign plan is still going to take place. Here's an example. Jesus is still going to come back. It doesn't matter what you do or what I do or what you don't do or what I don't do. Jesus is still going to come back. Now, the secret is, is we don't know when he's going to return, but God's sovereign plan is that his son will return. I think about in the Old Testament, a great example of this whole concept is a guy by the name of Joseph. Joseph comes from a pretty large family. He's got double-digit siblings, and and I don't know how many of you are part of a large family, but you know there's just some, some drama for your mama. Come on, in big families like that. Joseph wasn't only one of multiple children in the home, but he was his father's favorite child. With all humility, I know exactly how that feels. Come on, how many of you are the favorite child? Be honest, just own it right now. Like, I, you just know how that feels. Joseph's father, Jacob, bought him a coat of many colors. It was a special gift that he gave to his son. And so the other brothers already had some animosity towards him. And then one day, Joseph has this dream. And he decides to tell the dream to his brothers. This is a different sermon for a different day. But let me insert this thought here. You better be careful who you tell your dreams to. Joseph stands in front of his brothers and he says, I've had a dream and here's... Here's the interpretation of the dream. One day, every single one of you will bow at my feet. One day, all of you will fall under my authority. Well, the brothers already had some frustration because he was their father's favorite, and now they couldn't take it anymore. Read your Bible in Genesis. They strip him naked. They throw him in a pit. And in their divisive plan, they are going to leave him there to die. Well, then all of a sudden, a a group of of gypsies are traveling from Egypt, and these brothers sold their brother Joseph. They trafficked their brother and sold him to be a servant or a slave to these travelers. Then they took his uh, coat of many colors, the gift from his father, and they dipped it in animal's blood, and they returned home and presented this bloody coat to their dad and they said you know an animal mauled Joseph and you know he's dead and of course you can imagine Jacob being overwhelmed with grief and emotion he lost a son but the Bible says and I don't want you to miss this because this is important to your story too the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph 
even in the pit, even when he was sold, the Lord was with Joseph. And Joseph gets a good job. He gets a job in Potiphar's home, and, and he's taking care of, of the home, a, a, a rich individual by the name of Potiphar. And things are going well, and the Lord is with them, and there's favor on Joseph's life until one day he's falsely accused of something, and that false accusation actually lands Joseph, lands Joseph in prison. And for years, he was in prison. But the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. While in prison, God gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams. And on two different occasions, these prisoners had dreams that they needed someone to interpret. And so God gave Joseph the ability to interpret the dreams. And he did that, and people were amazed. The Bible talks about how the guard found favor, or, or Joseph found favor with the guard. And on one of these occasions, when the dream was interpreted, uh, that particular prisoner eventually ends up free. And that prisoner, that once imprisoned individual, is now is working for Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the ruler of Egypt. Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh calls on everybody to interpret the dream, and nobody's able to interpret the dream. And so this once imprisoned individual who's now working for the Pharaoh walks up to him, and he says, hey, there's a guy in prison by the name of Joseph. He has the ability to interpret dreams. So Pharaoh calls for Joseph, and now Joseph is standing right in front of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh begins to tell him the dream, and being led by the power of God, the Spirit of God, Joseph interprets a dream. And here's what he says. Lean in with me. If you're with me, say I'm with you. And Joseph said, well, here's the interpretation. There's going to be seven years of blessing, seven years of abundance, seven years of God's favor. At the end of the seven years, it'll be followed by seven years of devastation, seven years of drought, and seven years of famine. And God says through your dream that the only way that we'll ever be able to survive the seven years of famine and the seven years of drought and devastation is if we are wise and good stewards of God's blessing in the seven years of abundance. I don't mean this to be a prophetic word, but I feel like we're kind of headed that way. I digress. Pharaoh is overwhelmed with the interpretation that on the spot, he promotes Joseph from the prison to the palace. And he puts Joseph in charge of all of, the, all of the logistics of overseeing the stewardship of the seven years of abundance and over the distribution of the food, the rationing of the food during the seven years of famine. Here's what I mean. During the seven years of famine, nobody got food in the land unless they came and bowed at the feet of Joseph and he rationed them food. And then one day, all of Joseph's brothers show up and they bow at his feet. Now, the brothers didn't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized the brothers. And moved with emotion, he invited them to a dinner. He invited them to a banquet. And while they're at the banquet, while they're at the supper, Joseph stands up and he reveals his identity. And he says, it's me, your brother. You know the one you put in the pit? And the one you sold to those travelers, it's me. And the Bible says that the brothers became overwhelmed with great fear. And here's the word. Here's the word in the Bible here that's going to give you great encouragement to your own story. Watch what Joseph's response is. He says, don't be afraid of me. Am I, am I God that can punish you? And then he says this, watch. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Come on, somebody. The Bible says he brought me to this position so that I can save the lives of many people. And if God can take a secret plan and promote Joseph from the pit to the prison to the palace, whatever it is you're walking through today, whatever it is you're going through in this moment, even though it may not make sense in real time, God is working all things together for your good. Even though it may feel like God doesn't know what he's doing and that you feel like God is far off and he's forgotten you and you feel like you got handed the wrong deck of cards and you're frustrated in your season of uncertainty and your season of pain, even if the enemy has been attacking you and your family, can I get 25 people to help me preach? Come on. You can declare that what the devil meant for evil, God will make good. God's got a sovereign secret plan and he's working it out for your good. The old school church used to say it like this, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Come on and give him praise.
I don't know why things happen the way they do. And if you anticipated me to answer that question, you're going to leave here real disappointed. (laughs) I don't know the mind of God. And I don't know why you've walked through the, the stuff you've walked through. But I know this. Man, God is faithful. God is kind. God is loving. God is graceful. He's compassionate. And he's got you on his mind. Yeah, I wish I had a magical wand I could just wave and all of your problems are gone. But I, all I got is a towel. Come on, somebody. But what we do have is the Holy Spirit, intimate friendship with God that comforts us even in the middle of our uncertainty. And listen to me, if you don't get anything else from this whole message, you get this. Even though you don't understand it, God knows all of it. Even though you can't figure it out, you may never be able to figure it out. You will suffocate your life with the why question. I've got a lot of why questions in my life. I even told the Lord one time during my prayer time, I said, when I get to heaven, I got a lot of questions to ask you. And I didn't hear this in an auditory response, but I heard this in my heart of hearts, that when I get to heaven, all those questions won't matter. But I do know that through it all, that whatever the enemy meant for evil, God can make it good. So hang in there, church. Come on and give Jesus the best praise you've got. Come on. Come on, lift up your voice. Five seconds here. If you're walking through a season of uncertainty, thank God for his sovereignty. Come on. I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, but you ought to tweet that. Even in a season of uncertainty, thank God for his sovereignty. The second component of God's will, though, is not a secret. It's revealed. And here it is. I get asked this question often, and rightfully so, in different seasons of my life and moments of my life. I've asked God, what's your will for me? Some things I'll never know. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to you and your children forever. I don't mean this to be sarcastic, but this is a Bible. Come on, somebody. And God has written his will for our lives in this book. So while when we think about God's will for our life, typically it has to do with his blessings and prosperity and promotion and, you know, the the daily choices that we have to make. And we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm going to show you a few places in the Bible here as to why you're even alive and the purpose that you're alive. Beyond jobs and career and calling and all of that, if you are in a relationship with Christ Jesus, what does that look like? for a son or daughter of the faith. God, what is your will for my life? Here's the revealed will of God, and it starts in the Ten Commandments. All right, you want to know the will of God? Here it is. You can't have any other gods before me. This is the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. Can I get an amen? Amen. Culture is trying to pull us away from the Ten Commandments of God, but you have to be grounded and rooted on this is the revealed will of God. You don't get to make other idols. Now, we don't live in the days of golden statues and golden cows and Asherah poles, but we sure enough do live in the day of iPhone, iPad, I want a new one. Come on, somebody. Social media, fancy cars, big houses, working overtime. If we're not careful, we don't even realize that we've made certain things an idol. You want to know the will of God? Don't use the Lord's name in vain. The will of the Lord is to keep the Sabbath holy. The the will of the Lord is to honor your father and your mother. It's one of the first, it is the first commandment with a promise attached, that if you honor your father and mother, you'll be blessed with long life. It's the will of God that we don't murder of any kind. That, That we are faithful in our marriage. That husbands were committed to our wives and wives were committed to our husbands. Can I get an amen from, so this is the will of God. To to take back what you stole. Isn't that the will of God for you to cheat on your taxes? Come on, somebody. I remember the first time I ever stole anything. It was Kimberly's heart. Come on, somebody. I know I was going with that, baby. (laughs) Woo. 
Woo, love you, girl. Anyway, <laughs> the look on the face meant we need counseling. I'm in it to win it. I don't bear false witness. The, the will of God is that you don't lie. The will of God is that you don't covet. Well, let me just walk you through the revealed will of God here. Some of these you're going to be like, yes, say that. And others, others of these you're going to be like, ooh. This is a little hard to take, some of the truth of God's word here. It's like taking medication. That's why we call this the gospel. Come on, somebody. That is funny. I don't care who you are. <laughs> At lunch, some of you are going to get that joke, and you're going to appreciate the time I put in to telling my own jokes. Micah 6, 8, watch what the word says. The Lord has told you what is good. This is the revealed will of God. He told us what is required of you. Do what is right. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Matthew 6, this is the will of God. Here it is. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then everything else, all of the other anxieties, all of the other fears, all of the other worries, God's going to take care of all of it. The will of the Father is that you seek him first. I'm going to tell you something, and I've told you before, but it's not to brag on me because I'm a work in progress, but maybe it's to give you a thought to consider. I get up early. I'm a morning person anyway. But every morning at 6.33 a.m., my alarm clock goes off, and it's got this verse attached to it. Every day, 6.33 a.m. So by 6.33, although typically I've been up for just a little bit of time, my day hasn't really fully gotten started yet. And I pray this prayer over every day that I live. Okay, Lord, whatever today I'm going to encounter, from the long, exhausting meetings to the crazy people that just need you, Jesus. Can I get a testimony from somebody? Come on. I want to seek your kingdom and your righteousness first because that is God's will for my life. And then I'm confident that you're going to take care of everything else. You want to know the will of the Father for your life? Don't conform to the pattern of this world. But yet be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and what? perfect will. You want to know the will of the Father? Ephesians 4. Grow in every way more and more like Christ Jesus. That's the will of God. Look, it's not, okay, how can I, how can I build the business? How can I build the company? How can I become more whatever, financially stable, more successful? How can I climb the ladder of whatever God, God will add those things as you stay faithful to him. We'll talk about walking in God's blessings. Instead, it's God, you woke me up today. You clothed me in my right mind. If you never do one more thing for me, you've already done enough by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. And today, the will of the Father is that I grow to be more like you in every single way. Am I talking to anybody out there? Come on. Here's one. You want to know the will of the Father? Don't get drunk on wine. Uh-oh. Why? Because it's going to ruin your life. Instead, God's will is that you get drunk on the Holy Spirit. Come on now. I wish I had like 10 crazy Pentecostals in this room. Like I'm talking to a group of Nazarenes this morning. My Lord. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 3. It is God's will that you be sanctified, set apart. Pursuing righteousness and holiness, that is the will of God in that you avoid sexual immorality. Watch, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, the will of God is, is that you give thanks, and not just when things are good, but even in the seasons that you don't understand, God, what are you up to? It is the will of the Father that you just lift your hands, and you don't just live in joy, but you continue to rejoice. Come on, church. Give thanks in all things because that is God's will. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 15. It is God's will that you do good, that you do right, that you live a life above reproach, that you have high character, high morals, high integrity. And I love this. And when you do good, you silence the ignorant people that have been talking foolishly about you. 2 Peter 3, 9. Watch this. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think or consider slowness. Instead, God is patient with you. Anybody thankful God is patient with us? One translation says this, because it is not the will of the Father that anyone would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God, what is your will for my life? That you repent of your sin? 
that you accept Jesus Christ to be your Lord, that you submit your agenda, you submit your ways, you submit your will, and above all, you submit your heart, and you repent, and you invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Can we pause and say amen to that? Come on. Thank you, Lord. God, what is your will for my life? Some of the very last words that Jesus ever spoke before he ascended to heaven. And that's where he is today. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for his people. And he's waiting for his dad to say, okay, it's time to return. So before Jesus ascends to heaven, some of the last words that he says to his disciples, known as the Great Commission, is the will of the Father for us. Therefore, go. That's why we call ourselves Go Church here, in case you were wondering. We get it from the Great Commission. This is the will of God for your life, to go and make disciples. It doesn't matter what you do vocationally. Uh, listen, we need doctors and lawyers and teachers and plumbers and mechanics and pastors. Can I get an amen from someone? We need service men and women. Whatever trait that you're involved in, God has scattered you with giftings so that you can make disciples in whatever environment you're in. Listen, uh, you, don't, you don't need to leave your job to go into the full-time ministry. Your marketplace is your ministry. Go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and I will be with you to the very end of the age. This is the revealed will of God and we could stay here for days and weeks and go through all 66 books beginning in Genesis and ending in the book of Revelation and see why God has given you breath in your lungs. And check this out. It's never really about you. It's all for his glory and for his honor. You've got the secret will of God. You have the revealed will of God. Now let's talk about how God gives us free will. This is a big one. Free will is the ability to choose it's the power of choice. I like to say it this way. When God created Adam and Eve, when God made mankind, he made humans, not machines. Machines can't feel, think, act. They can't behave. They can't express emotions. They don't feel anything. They do everything that the designer designed for them to do. And God didn't make us machines. God made us human beings, and we have logic, and we have reasoning, and, and we have faith, and we have worry, and we have fears, we have emotions. Does that make sense? And God gave us free will. He, he gave Adam and Eve free will in the garden. He gave them a command, don't eat from that one tree, but everything else is yours. You get free will. And he gives you free will on the choices that that you have to make every single day. And listen, we got big choices that we make, and then we got small choices that we make. You know, for some of you right now, you're sitting here listening to me talk, and the one choice that you're just wrestling with is, man, where are we going to eat lunch when he stops talking? <laughs> and Sundays is a little bit more tricky because Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. Come on. That's a little choice where we eat, but then there are, there are big choices, and I'll share some of those. There's actually four different areas of God giving us free will that I want to unpack. Write all of these down, okay? Here's the first one. The first area of free will is that we have free will to decide what God we're going to serve. You decide that. The Bible says that you have to work out your own salvation. Now, there are some people that are in this room or one of our campuses or online and and, and in your mind, you're sitting there thinking, I, I, don't, I don't even believe in God. Okay, that, that's, that's you. I'm, I'm not your judge. And I know you look at us and you think, man, that's a bunch of crazy people that would believe that there's a God. I just want to say this to you, and I know I'm having a conversation, and you're just kind of listening, but I say this respectfully. It takes just as much faith to believe that there is no God than it does to denounce the evidence of the beauty that there is a God. And I've thought about this. If at the end of my life, so I've, I've committed to having faith in God, that I'm going to serve God, and not lowercase g gods, but like the uppercase g God, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
So I've committed my life to having faith that there is a God that loves me unconditionally, that accepts me in, in spite of all of my flaws and insecurities and mess ups and all of that. So if at the end of my life I die and I was wrong, my life is still better because God gave me a community of people that were just as misled as I was. So if I'm wrong, I don't, I don't lose anything. But if you don't believe in God and on the day that you die, you were wrong. The consequences of that are far greater than if I were wrong. And let me say one more thing here. There are some of you that you are just like riding the coattails of someone else's faith. So you've not really committed to serving God. And you lean on, well, you know, well, my grandmother is just an unbelievable Christian. That doesn't matter. God bless granny. Come on now. I hear this all the time. Well, you know, my uncle was a deacon. Good for him. You're a sinner. Look at somebody and say, I think he's talking right at you. Go ahead and tell him. I think he's talking. He ain't talking to me. You got to work out your own self. And watch this. Only you can choose what God you're going to serve. God gave you free will. Now, here's the encouragement in Joshua 24. The encouragement is, I would suggest you fear the Lord and that you serve him with all faithfulness, that you throw away the gods, the lowercase g gods of your ancestors and how they worshiped them and, and you serve the Lord. Verse number 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, here it is, watch, then choose for yourselves today, May 22nd, 12.09 in the afternoon, or whenever you watch this message, you choose today whom you will serve. And then watch this. And this is just where the worldlies are. I can't do anything about your house, but I can do something about my house. I, I am getting older. I feel that in me. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Let's just, it's who we do. You do you, boo. We're going to serve the Lord. I tell my kids all the time, <laughs> this is so funny. It goes full circle, doesn't it? As long as you live under my roof, come on, somebody. As long as you live in this house, you watch what I say you watch. We listen to what I say we listen to. You hang out with who I say you can hang out with because as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, there's coming a day where my two children will reach an age of accountability and they have to work out their own salvation. But if I raise up a child in the ways of the Lord, when they grow old, they won't depart from it. Come on. We're just serving God. God gives you free will to decide who you're going to serve. But then it goes a step further. Then God gives us free will to decide if we're going to obey or disobey. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Uh, some of us are Christian by word and mouth. But the evidence doesn't line up with what we say. It's the old saying, it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. If you are a Christian, then you obey the revealed will of God. And guess what? You're not gonna be perfect. And the good news is this, perfection's not the goal. It's not the, perfection's not the goal. Holiness is the goal. Every day saying, okay, I want to stay, take one step closer to you. And God says, if you, if, there are consequences if you obey or disobey. Just like parenting. Come on, parents. And God says, there are, there are blessings if you obey. There are curses if you disobey. So you get free will to decide. Not just if I choose to serve God, but am I going to obey God? And here, here's what you need to know. That we're living in a world that is, is moving the, the needle of morality and the needle of Christian values and ethics more, more far away from this than ever before. So culture and society will tell you that this is antiquated and it's not applicable and, you know, it's just a history book. Don't make me get angry. Come on, somebody. So you have to decide. As you are in this cultural tug of war, there's only one authority and it's this. I need a hundred people to say amen. Come on. This is the final authority. So listen, you come here every week and I, I share a message with you and I tell a lot funnier jokes than you laugh at. But my opinion doesn't matter. My, my words don't matter. This matters. This matters. So as a Christian, are you going to obey the word or are you going to disobey the word? 
the Bible says this. I got to move on. Watch in Deuteronomy. We'll stay in Deuteronomy for a few minutes. If you fully obey the Lord, watch, and you carefully follow his commands. So God, I want to follow your word. I want to follow your will. Watch. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. Verse 2. And all these blessings. Anybody want the blessings of God? No, Anybody? So all of these blessings will come on you and they will accompany you. Let's read this last highlighted phrase on three. One, two, three. If you obey the Lord your God. However, if you don't obey the Lord and you choose your agenda, your ambition, your way, your will, and you don't carefully follow his commands, then all of these curses will come on you and they will overtake you. I got to move. Watch this. The third area of free will is this. You get to choose life or death. That choice is yours. Obviously, the emphasis here is on spiritual life and spiritual death, but all of us have been impacted by someone that has taken their own life by way of suicide. My family isn't exempt from that pain. The month of May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And as a part of one of the weeks of this Ask Away series, one of the most asked questions was, how can I overcome anxiety and depression? We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about it. Give me a couple weeks and we'll talk about it. And we know people that have been overcome with anxiety and depression and they've battled their own whatever. And they've taken life or death into their own hands. And look, you get, you get the free will to choose not only that outcome, but even more importantly, the spiritual result. You get to decide if you inherit life forevermore or you decide if you'll spend eternity separated from God. God sends no one to hell. No one is sent to hell by God. People choose eternal separation from God because you have free will to decide. Deuteronomy, I told you we stay here. Watch. I have set before you, let's read this on the count of three. One, two, three. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Isn't that encouraging today? Come on, that is so encouraging. All right, you got time for one more? Hang in there. I'll give you the final one. And this is the big one for us. This is the one that we really process like every day. I got decisions to make. Every day, I've got choices to make, and some of them seem so big. If you just Google, and you could do this later, if you just Google life's biggest choices, man, there's hundreds of thousands of decisions that you have to make. So I'm not going to put all of them on, on the slide here, but I just tried to compact a few things just to kind of connect with maybe you are where you are in this season. Some of you are dating, and you're like, man, should I marry that person? Is he the one? Is she the one? Some of you are married and you're like, man, should we have children or should we adopt a child? I inserted this one in here because me and the kids are praying that Kimberly will let us get a dog. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and I, listen, I'm the man of my house. And if you'll let us get a dog, I'll get one. <laughs> you know, should I take that job offer in a different city? How many of you think I should get a dog? I just felt led by the Lord. It's a quick vote. You're on, you're on number, girl. You know, should I take that job in a different city? Should I quit my current job? Just a little bit of pastoral love. I wouldn't quit your job until you got another job lined up. Come on now. <laughs> should I join the military? God bless you for even considering that. Seriously. Should we buy the house? Should we sell our house? Man, you look at the market right now. You can, you can sell your house. Where are you going to go? You ain't moving in with me. I promise you that. Unless you got a dog, then we could talk. I mean, we'll be talking about a little dog then, but no. And if you got a cat, you ain't even invited to my neighborhood. Come on, anybody with me on that? Rebuke you and Jeep. A little cat with her attitude. Some of y'all made bad choices by getting a cat over a dog. You do need prayer. I'll move on. Should I attend college? Should I get another degree? I don't even know why I put this one in there. Like, should I start working out? You don't have to pray about that. Could you imagine if you're like, Lord, I come to you humbly today. Your will be done in my life. 
should I start working out? What would you do if he was like, nah, nah, just get fat. Eat a little Debbie. Get you a second little Debbie. I love you. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, get in the gym. Come on, somebody. I told somebody the other day, I will never work out another day in my life. I think I need to work out at least one more day in my life. Now, when we look at this list, here's what happens. And this statement isn't just from teenagers, but it's from people. Well, it's my life. I'll do whatever I want. Your decisions have ripple effects. And the consequences of your decisions affect generation after generation. Paul told the church at Corinth, look how crazy applicable this is. Paul said, you say, well, I'm allowed to do anything that I want. And Paul responds, but not everything is good for you. Well, I'm allowed to do anything. And Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. Does that make sense? Not everything is beneficial. And I think for so many people, like, you're so worried about staying in the will of God. Here's what I believe. That as long as you pursue God, you're not going to get out of his will. Because the steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord. You stop pursuing God, though, and you start pursuing your agenda, your ambitions, your goals, your dreams, your job, your career, your education, and you remove God from the seat of top priority, yeah, you can get out of alignment quick, and it may start like a slow drift, but over time you'll look back and see how out of alignment you really are. But in John 15, the Bible talks about staying connected to the true vine, that if you abide in me and I abide in you, in me you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So my idea of pursuing God is saying every day, God, I wanna be connected to you. It's not my will, it's your will. It's not my way, it's your way. It's not my word, Lord, no, it is your word. And now I know that as long as I pursue you with humility and repentance, you'll keep me in the perfect will of God because the steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord. I wanna give you one image before we transition here. It's the tightrope versus the valley of a Grand Canyon. God's will for your life is not this balancing act. That man, I just, I don't, if I make one mistake, I'm gonna fall off and it's over. You can get out of the will of God, but if you're pursuing God and you're committed to seeking him first, it's not a tightrope. It's as wide and vast as the Grand Canyon. Who wants you to be in God's perfect will any more than God himself? He's not an evil God. He's not in heaven with your plan, your will, and he's got it like this saying, good luck finding it. No. God, I just want to be in your will. I want to be in your perfect, sovereign, holy will. And when you do that, doors will begin to open and opportunities will be in front of you. And you'll be able to see clearly the direction that you should go. I'm gonna give you all five of these real quick. So before you make a big decision, here's the five things you gotta do. What does the Bible say about it? Take a picture of this, come on, write it down. What does the Bible say? Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. God's will for your life will never contradict God's word for your life. So you've got a decision to make. What does God's word say about it? Have I spent focused time in prayer about it? Like, am I really praying about it? A lot of times you and I, when we pray, it's us praying, hoping we can change God's mind. Like, God, I really, I really, need, I really need this. We see eye to eye, right? Let me ask you a question. It's rhetorical. When is the last time you took something you really wanted and you took that to God in prayer and he changed your mind? We just want God to be a, a vending machine. Like give us what we want, give us what we want. But when we really commit to prayer, God will convict our hearts. Here's the next one, through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, God will convict us. Romans 8, 5, write that verse reference down. That if you try to gratify the desires of the flesh, you'll do it. Or you can walk according to the Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Which, by the way, that inner voice is not Jiminy Cricket. That is the Holy Spirit. What do my wise Christian family and friends say about it? If everybody in your life that loves you genuinely is countering what you want to do, so if you want it and they say it's not right, maybe it's not right. 
Like if everybody is telling you he's not the one for you, and you're like, oh, but I can change him. Proverbs 15, 22 says that without wise counsel, your plans will fail miserably. But with good counsel, God's plan will prevail. So who's in your life giving you wise, godly counsel? And I put this word Christian, because you need people that got faith in their life to give you the counsel that's needed. And then finally, is am I willing to wait for it? One thought with this. Some of the most dumb decisions I've ever made were rushed decisions. Some of the worst financial decisions I ever made, I hurried to make the decision. Some of the most painful relationship decisions I've ever made were because I rushed that decision. If, this is a filter by the way, if, if your attitude is I need it now, I gotta have it right now, 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 now. The Bible says they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So just counter that, all right? Here's the final questions. What did the Lord speak and what's my next steps?